Okay. So I think it's time to say it. Should I say it? Should I say it? Say it. Hello, hello. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Life Man, a podcast undescribably tangled, unnecessarily complex. So bad, that it's so bad, that it's good. Life Math. So today we have a, a special and today is the startup special. What I mean by this is that after having released uh, a number of episodes, we've had a lot of feedback from people. A lot of you came back to us with other questions or just general feeling of how they perceived our podcast, what they liked, what they didn't like. And we noticed that many of you were particularly interested in the, the startups episode that we did, the anthology of startup anecdotes. And so we decided to do this special, which is going to be about the past one year or one year and a bit, which is the exact time span in which we have started and worked on Triveta, our startup. So this is a sort of overview of looking back the first one year of a startup, because many people give you kind of general tips. So have a startup, do this, do that, don't do a third thing. But they're kind of general. So I just want to try this format where we firsthand talk about, we talk about our firsthand experience as it's happening one year into this business. Where it is, where does it stand? Where is it going? How does it match our expectations? What have we learned? What have we did? Uh, what have we done well? What have we done poorly? This kind of stuff. I'm very interested to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> Should I subscribe? Is this the, the point at which I subscribe, leave my email and follow you everywhere? Yes. Also, give us money. And tell a friend about the podcast. Well, that was a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, this whole thing is one large ad for Thirveta and you have to bear bear through with it. Actually, actually, to be honest, I asked Iskran, why do you want to do this episode? And he's like, oh man, everybody is asking me what's going on with Thirveta. Let's just simply... Re- actually, to be honest, I asked Iskran, why do you want to do this episode? And he's like, oh man, everybody is asking me what's going on with Thirveta. Let's just simply record it so I can send it to people. <laughs> Basically, uh, I, I just don't want to talk to people. I want to talk into a microphone alone in the room. <laughs> Perfect communication. Purely one way. <laughs> no feedback received. Uh, Since we haven't plugged Triveta just yet in this podcast, maybe some listeners don't know what our product is. All right. Do you want to give the, the generic sentence? <laughs> yeah. So the platform that we have built and are currently marketing and scaling is called Triveta.com, three with the number, and is a platform which unifies your client bookings, video calls, workshops, payments, and much more. With Triveta, you can build your own booking page, your own website, completely wildly incredible for some people. This whole episode is going to be about our experience at Triveta. Basically, where we stand now is the following. One year later, we have developed a product. It is online. By now, enough time has passed that it's not just the first rough version and prototype. No, it's had so many iterations. So many people have looked at it and used it that it's quite polished by now. Also, it has quite a few different functionalities and features that it's starting to get you know, like a fully fledged platform with kind of many legs you can use for different things. And then after several different promotional campaigns, finally, we kind of found this one breakthrough uh, where with this promotional campaign, which was international essentially, we managed to get several hundred paying users to use our system as providers. And this was essentially our big breakthrough where after more than a year of struggling hundreds of people who do use the platform, uh, which couldn't make us happier, obviously. And that's kind of where we are now. So we have found a way to find several hundred people to actively use us but not yet how to scale it, you know, even more. Yeah, that's just for the future, right? So that's where we are now compared to one year ago. And have in mind that throughout this one year, the first year, for the vast majority of time, we didn't really have users. So it was scary throughout most of the time. And we kept trying to think, okay, what are we doing wrong? Why why is this not happening? Kept trying different options and eventually something succeeds. It was a pre 
I know, mentally stressful time as well. You know, are we in the right direction? We don't know. There's no road signs to, to let us know. So it's brilliant for us that we have actual feedback now. Um, but yeah, one year ago, we thought that this feedback would appear. I remember it, the very first, very first roadmap. We thought roadmap. We thought that in the first three months, we would start receiving actual user feedback. In fact, it took a year and three months to get, well, not some, but like a lot of feedback, right? We're getting some feedback before, but it was a bit patchy. Whereas now we have abundant feedback from your users more than one year in. Let's see, the, the first kind of topic I want to look into is you know, where we stand now compared to where we thought we would be one year in the future when we started the company. So, Ilya, try to mentally transport yourself back in time one year and just remember where your mental state was. Imagine how you perceived the one-year future of Trevetta when we founded the company. We had this amazing timeline that we created and we're absolutely off the timeline and we need a new timeline and we need a new timeline with new highlights, new milestones on the timeline because it's practically a different beast. We had this timeline that we expected our product to have some MVP ready for people to use maybe in January or February of 2021. So we expected that we will start selling the product January, February, and then maybe by March, April, we would have some feedback, we would start implementing it, and then by June, July, we would have some refined product. What actually happened was that we absolutely overcomplicated and overkilled the whole product. And we were struggling with finishing the product until maybe June. And then in June, we went live with the product. We made the product hunt launch and so on and so forth. From this point on, we started selling product until maybe June. And then in June, we went live with the product, we made the product hunt launch, and so on and so forth. From this point on, we started selling it. Right now, it is the 14th of October when we are recording this. Basically, it took us, what, three, four months to get a couple hundred users from the actual MVP, right? The problem there was that our definition of an, of an MVP, minimum viable product, was very, very overblown. <laughs> very broad. So here's definitely, we've discussed internally, but it's definitely something worth mentioning in this episode that we completely yeah, over-engineered the product. We made it so much more than it could have been for a minimal product. And obviously we regard this as a mistake, not like a mistake to beat up ourselves retroactively, but something to learn from, right? And for overkilling solutions, we all do try to um, find a shortcut to the solution rather than try to build the most complex structure ever. However, I still think that all of us also still fall um, in this trap sometimes, right? So basically we're better, but it's not something you can really completely uproot. It just keeps happening and you have to keep fighting against this over-engineering syndrome every day on each step of everything you do. Like I, I was surprised how much on basically every decision, it doesn't matter how big or, or small the decision, there's always a way to overcomplicate it. And when those things start compounding, it really starts hurting the overall progress. Yeah, I guess the, the first really big lesson learned from this is just don't do complex things. There's no time. Time just flies. And if you do unnecessarily complex stuff, you don't have time. Time just flies. And if you do unnecessarily complex stuff, you don't even know if anybody will ever use it. Like we spent so long on certain features that in the end, you didn't even see the light of day. So point number one, do the simple immediate solution, right? Sooner is better. So another thing I, I wanted to give an honorary mention to is when we're starting the product, we define those four pillars of the functionality that we want to chase. And they were video, payments, website builder, and scheduling. We decided, okay, those are the four core ideas that we need to work on. And then 
uh, we, we need to also have the connections between all of them. So you schedule for a meeting, you can pay for it, and you can book it through a booking page, which is the website builder. So they're all interrelated. But in essence, those are the, the, the four pillars of the product. Okay, I have an idea. Each one of us picks two, and we have to say, what did we do wrong? <laughs> okay, sure. So basically, this fits into what I was like going into. So based on this, let me just finish the setup. So we had to prioritize, right? We, we started building from scratch, so we have to, to, to choose. And out of those four, we're like, oh, guys, we're, we're absolutely certain that we should definitely start with video and payments, right? So in the very first iteration, what we call the alpha version of the product, which got released to a limited number of people for testing, we just had payments in video. What this means is that we had a platform where people can sign up, they can send links, which when uh, their clients receive, they get to pay a fixed amount that the provider has declared and then join a video meeting. So it was literally a paid video meeting, right? We're very happy with the result. We thought, okay, we've crossed two out of the four pillars. Now, where does the issue come? And I, I see this now in retrospect that we should have probably picked differently is that regarding the payments, they were the very first thing we we're excited about. Yes, payments. In fact, now real world problems. The reality is that the payments are the most underutilized aspect of the platform. People want to talk, people want to schedule their talks, people want to have a booking page, people want to do all of those things. People want to send files left and right, but people don't actually, turns out, want to pay each other for those calls. Most of the requests in this direction are how to sidestep this complication and, and have like, oh, he pays me somewhere externally or uh, it was just free meetings here. So basically, now that we have the whole platform and enough user data to know what's actually being used, turns out that we started building it from the least used component, right? I mean, obviously we couldn't have known at the time and that's just what we assumed would happen is usage, but you know, I do feel a bit silly now <laughs> that we started from the least used aspect. However, on the upside, the other module we started with is video, which is still the platform. So I guess we picked the best and the worst. I remember we were making you like, Iso, please, please have free meetings. And you're like, no, this is a paid video meeting platform. <laughs> and it was very, very, yeah. um, it's a very good use case. But now with all the information that, that we have about the industry, usually video plus payments, there are these calls that are paid by the minute. So this is the use case. And we were definitely not positioning ourselves in this realm. Of pay, pay by the minute. Right, yeah, I remember it. About the payments, I just wanted to add, what people want is to pay in bundles. So they want to pay several meetings up front or they want to send a payment link. And this is something we learned the hard way. Yeah, basically I remember, yeah, I remember being against spending time on making it a free video platform because I was afraid, oh, why would they not use literally anything else if it's just free? It's because I was afraid, oh, why would they not use literally anything else if it's just free, et cetera, et cetera. And then it turns out that I was very wrong. And why was I wrong? Well, because people enjoyed the white labelness, meaning the fact that they can brand their threat the platform with their own branding, unlike with Zoom or others. But what they liked primarily is the fact that they can white label their video calls and most of all, schedule them. So scheduling turned out to be the absolute key problem which actually we left for last. So saying this, since we split the, the four pillars of the platform between ourselves, you can, you can say a couple words about the scheduling and... Scheduling. We left this component for last, as Iskran mentioned. And the reason to do this is that scheduling is very hard from a tech perspective, and we didn't want to deal with time zones. We didn't want to deal with the whole bunch of problems that arise from this. Like, okay, let's build everything else. And once we have the whole structure, we can add scheduling and it's going to fit perfectly in everything else. Problem was, the biggest problem for me as a sales and marketing person was that we had to sell the platform. And even in March or April, when we already had video payments at website, we didn't have scheduling. And I was desperately trying to sell the product to random people but the value proposition wasn't there 
we were always like, scheduling is coming, you'll be able to schedule, you'll be able to have a booking page, people will be able to, to book you seamlessly, but they couldn't see it, you know? How do you demo such a product? You write to the people, and then you start scheduling this complicated meeting with a back, back and forth emails or messages like, let's have a call at 4 p.m., I don't know, CET, or back and forth emails or messages like, let's have a call at 4 p.m., I don't know, CET, or let's have a meeting at that point. There are no reminders. There are no calendar events. There are no confirmations. So instead of using our product to schedule the meeting and have everything perfect, we didn't have scheduling. So selling this product was absolutely impossible. So with scheduling, two big mistakes. First, we did not realize that this is the most sought after feature. We didn't realize that the video plus the scheduling is the biggest value proposition, let's say. And second of all, this was the biggest problem for our sales efforts. We couldn't start selling the product before we had scheduling. It just didn't work. So yeah, and and of course I could always schedule a meeting with some other software like this, but yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather send 10 emails than... Which ones to, to build first? And also for the audience, have in mind that this choice means that we're committed for months of development, right? So we choose video and payments and for months in a row, we're busy implementing this. So we can't just add some scheduling. Then we choose scheduling and it's still months of development effort. Uh, Iso, can you please tell the listeners how many developers were working on the project? Yeah, so we had myself and then five extra developers, I believe. I mean, you know, through time it kind of changed. There were sometimes more, sometimes less. I think at the peak it was actually plus six and then plus a QA person on the side as well. So the the dev team was for a startup of significant size and still these things just take time. Like development is just proportionately expensive compared to virtually everything else for a software company, right? So all of the other expenses for not just human resources, but also things like marketing, sales, okay, sure, they're expensive, but development is absolutely, development is absolutely through the roof expensive if you go overboard with designing the platform, right? And what all of us, I'm sure, are, you know, wish they had avoided in some way, but I don't know how we could have actually really avoided, is the fact that in the end, when we draw the bottom line, I'm sure that we utilize only maybe about half of the development effort that we put in and paid for and got delayed for, right? So basically our efficiency when choosing what to develop and how to develop it, I would say it's been about a half. So like what I mean is that there's many pieces of software that we wrote and then for some reason removed, overhauled, had to change, something like this, which it's part of the normal process, right? Nobody gets anything right the first time, especially something as complex, but it definitely happens. Something I want to just add a very, very good part of our dev strategy was that we had Iskren in-house as the CTO, Iskren in-house as the CTO, and we were working with this company, Camplight, special shout out to Camplight. And Highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, so they're a cooperative, I believe that's how they call themselves, and uh, they're, a... okay, so I'm going to absolutely cripple the way they present themselves, but let me try. They're a bunch of dev people and one or two business people. The business people find work for the developers and the developers are world-class developers who hop from project to project. And when we decided to work with them, what we wanted was to have the strategy in-house, to have our um, CTO, so the the chief technical officer in-house, but use the manpower of highly skilled developers who we don't need to hire because we can always upscale we don't need to hire because we can always upscale and downscale so whenever we need more developers camplight can help us with that and if we if for some reason we decide to stop developing the product we can also reduce the number of developers quite fast and it's literally overnight we can get like five guys working on our project, five more guys, let's say. So thank you, Camplight, for being a part of Triveta's journey. Yeah, so Camplight was a very, very good hit exactly because we could scale up and down 
um, very easily as the demand for software was increasing or decreasing. We also did have Mimi, one person in-house, so that was very helpful because um, she was with us for many months and she built so many core pieces. Now she's a data science consultant. If you need data science help, we can refer you. <laughs> exactly. Drop us an email. We have the best data science consultant. <laughs> so I wanted to go hard after payments and make them on indispensable part of the system just to realize that they're the, the least desired feature at least as of now how do you think we should have approached this you know do you think we could have done anything differently at the time having the information we had or just no that's just the process it's trial and error right because obviously it's very easy to say oh we should have done this other thing but how could we have known right so what maybe kind of little experiment could we have done at the time how, how could we have received this crucial market feedback that we now have received, but before having the product? Well, what we did in the end in terms of payments is that we integrated this very, not very, but relatively complex system, Stripe Connect, which is the best solution in the world when it comes to building a platform where people can create, other people can pay them. So this was the best in the world. And what we could have done was prototype this and basically prototype this and basically have a simple payment link, maybe use PayPal or something like this, just to see do people actually use payments and not integrate this whole complex system into the core of Triveta. And I say in the core because whenever we talk about changing payments, adding other payment providers, it it is very, very much related with building parallel infrastructure or changing this Stripe connecting. And yeah, we could have prototyped this one. We were building to scale, you know, that was our motto from day one. And if we had 10,000 people using the platform in the first three months, well, Stripe Connect is the best way to do it. So in retrospect, could have tried it out with a PayPal link, or a simple payment link. I remember I, I had this one kind of crazy preposterous idea that got shut down quickly. But tried it out with a PayPal link or a simple payment link. I remember I, I had this one kind of crazy preposterous idea that got shut down quickly. But in retrospect, I think it would have been good actually. Basically, I proposed let's not build it at all, not even like a simple solution. Let's not have a payment solution, just make it into a virtual kind of gimmick, kind of have, have a payment page where people can pay with just you know, car details, a simple form. But then there's nothing connected to it. It's just a simple front-end visual form. And then when people try to pay, so when somebody tries to pay for a consultation, let's say, I don't know, like $50, because there's no actual payment, we take it out of our own pocket and pay the provider. So in front of their eyes, everything works fine kind of magically, we take the hit financially, but receive the confirmation people use the payment, right? So we could have committed some budget, maybe like a thousand or something. Okay, people do use the payments, let's let's create them. And so it sounds crazy to do this kind of stuff, but right now we have spent, we have spent more on development costs to make it happen than we would have spent on covering those fees out of our own pocket if we had never created payments. We had to prototype this, but again, you know, this is this avalanche of wrong steps. You you take the wrong step to uh, do the video and payments first, and then you leave scheduling for last. This cripples your sales. At the same time, you can't prototype payments anymore because you've decided to build payments as the, literally the first thing you build. And, and, yeah, and then every other process builds on top of this payment system. And yeah, so overall... Now we're stuck with being amazing for payments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, so we, we kind of sound like uh, downers for now. Like, oh, we did this wrong, we did that wrong. With being amazing for payments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, so we, we kind of sound like uh, downers for now. Like, oh, we did this wrong, we did that wrong. However, let's make it clear. Like, we're one year and a bit into the business and with the recent events and developments, we are actually very happy because now we have hundreds of active users. We have tons of very useful real user feedback. Uh, so right now I would say that it's actually going 
good, right? Slower than we expected initially, but we're just being unreasonable. So yeah, let's not be such downers, right? And for example, regarding those payments, yeah, we did spend the development effort on it and it did cost us time uh, when it was crucial to be quick to get out to market. Okay, we've taken this hit. However, now that we are out, now that we have real users, is just an upside that we have it, right? Absolutely. Very important to state this. If things didn't go well for us, that could have been a very big mistake. However, could have been a very big mistake. However, now, now that things are going well, it is just a cherry on top. <laughs> so I wanted to... By the way, before you go, I just want to check how many people have onboarded with Stripe. Sorry, oh, yeah. I just... Yeah, about 10% of all the people on the Triveta platform are set up to receive payments. Yeah, we could have left it for later. <laughs> yeah. But, but guys, whoever is building a startup, it is a great retention technique. Once they start receiving payments through this platform, there is no going away. You know, this is one of the things which logs them to the system if it works properly, right? If everything is nice and they receive the payments and everything, they never want to change. So yeah, it's a great retention. So discussing uh, those features and what we've done, what we haven't done, I was going to ask you, what do you think is the single most preposterous thing with the overkilled ridiculously and needlessly? Like the one thing you just oh, have an axe to grind with. Yes, cookie consent to <laughs> This is the absolute worst thing ever. We built this extremely complex system which was governing the whole cookie consent tool in different languages, on different subdomains, all these things. I don't even know how we started doing this. And now I'm just looking at it. And every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, it looks so, it looks very nice, works very nice, but come on, come on. Like we've all seen cookie consent tools. It's absolute overkill. Yeah. Because I remember when we were building it, you know, it was just before Christmas and it was me, you and Ilko. Ilko is one of the most senior guys uh, we have worked with from Camplight and a great developer. And so and <laughs> we, <laughs> we had this huge campaign coming up the next day. It was just, I don't even know how to explain it in English, but here in Bulgaria, we have this banitsa, which is a type of pastry which uh, where we put fortunes, kind of like fortune cookies. Let's say it's like, yeah, our festive Christmas version of uh, fortune cookies. So I kind of made a little interactive game with it where people can can draw their you know, their fortune cookie for, for next year, for the new year. Just to emphasize the point that, oh, you can do many things online, including draw fortune cookies with your family if you're stuck somewhere else uh, away from them because of... Uh, lockdown and quarantine and stuff like this it was a cool idea it should have been a one two day project it was in the end by the way it got us ten thousand hits on the website just in like two days it was incredible we were on new year's eve and it was like thousands of people were on our website like it was in the end by the way it got us ten thousand hits on the website just in like two days it was incredible we were on new year's eve and it was like tal Thousands of people were on our website, like playing the game, the mini game. It was very cool. And um, so it worked, kind of. We got indexed by Google, which was very important. Indexed by Google. We got our domain authority a bit. We started ranking for different things because of this inflow of people. But we are preparing for this. And how do we prepare? We built the cookie consent tool because we can't have people's data without them consenting to it. And it's me, you and Ilko building this and I'm kind of coding something. Okay, so Ilko had to do two things. He had to complete the cookie consent tool and he had to, I, I, I think, work on the structured data. So structured data, when people share links from Triveta, they need to display the right images, say the right words and not something generic and so on. So you gave me this task, guys, because it was the easiest task for a non non programmer, and I was I was just writing some code, and in the end I did it. So it was great. It worked, <laughs> and I remember asking you like, "Okay, amazing. 
I just have one question. What language did I code in? <laughs> because I can code in Python and I could code this, but I had no clue what it is. <laughs> and then you explained to me that this is TypeScript, the new language of the future. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yes. and, and this was me. Ilko, in the meantime, building this cookie consent tool, writing chukka, 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 clicky, clicky. <laughs> and we were speaking to each other. All our wives and girlfriends were absolutely pissed. I remember Masha was, Masha was pissed. I remember Ilko's wife was pissed. Probably your girlfriend, future wife was pissed as well. <laughs> I mean, it was the first Christmas I spent with her and her family at their house. And, I, you know, I was gone the whole evening on the 23rd. Around lunchtime on the 24th, I had to go as well because we realized there's some issue. Yeah, overkill. Cookie consent too. The most hated feature in my mind. But how about yours? Mm. Okay, so that's a that's a yeah. The, you have a very very strong point that we overkilled this. Very interesting. Very strong contestant. Mine, I think, the one that I just can't let go. You know, mentally you just keep getting annoyed at at, at past events. The one for me is the <laughs> the so-called facelift of the video tool. Going back to the four features. Iso, your turn for the video. You can rant about it. Several months now, we have something working. We have absolutely nailed payments, which you know <laughs> makes no difference to our customers because they don't want payments, but we've nailed them, right? And so we also have video, but essentially some background, the video solution, uh, as with virtually everything you build, you don't start from scratch. There are those available tools and projects that you start building from. And so we got this video solution and we started building on top of it. And the thing is that very, very, very quickly, we reached something that worked fine. It just works fine, right? I think you built it, in a, you, you spun it up in a day, I think. I actually remember this day. I was alone in London. Julia had gone somewhere and it was a Saturday. And anyway, I remember like it was one of those days when I had no plans. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit down and try to smash this and i i did i didn't really know much about this topic in particular at the time I remember like it was one of those days when i had no plans and i was like okay i'm just gonna sit down and try to smash this and i i did i didn't really know much about this topic in particular at the time so we had a working video solution in one day and it was fine it worked fine it looked decent and it was okay right and so at this point you guys are thinking okay you have payments you have video nice go on just move on to scheduling go to market no instead what we did is the absolute overkill of overkills for me personally which is we decided ah people are not going to use this generic looking video we need to facelift it to make it nicer visually but obviously being nice visually is a very subjective thing so maybe for some people even the generic template would have looked better so then we ended up spending actually literally weeks and weeks of development effort on its folly but we've somehow already fallen into it and you know once you're midway you don't want to quit you just want to kind of finish it but then more issues keep arising and we walked on this side path that nobody wanted to be on for weeks in a row and then eventually <laughs> yeah we we facelifted the whole video it was completely ours with our vision we're like Phew, okay, that was, that was a lot, but we, we finished it. And then like a month later, for other reasons, we were forced to actually check all of this work and move to another solution, which has the generic screen anyway. How many lines of code did you delete that day from the code base? Many. I think it was something <laughs> like 50,000. Oh, I, I don't remember exactly, but like, it's essentially weeks worth of, of work and investment, both time and money-wise. And I can't let it go that what we absolutely should have done. And I can't let it go that what we absolutely should have done is use the generic solution the way it looks, which was a decent look, even if it's not our colors and stuff like this. And yeah, move on to scheduling and things. So that's my absolute biggest axe to grind with our, our process at the time. But I fell for it too. Well, I feel a bit detached from this one because basically the dev effort was with 
the dev team and the facelift was with the design team. So it's one of those tasks I was getting updated on, but I was never a very big part of it. So I, I don't hold this great grudge towards it. It pisses me off as well. I really hate it. I don't want to think about it too much. But yeah, I was not so involved. By the way, there is a business case for facelifting. There are other software. What they're doing is they're providing some kind of video API with their facelift on it. And people fall for it. Most beautiful video. And I think this was the thing we were going after. You know, we were like, oh, we want to have the most beautiful video. Now... I don't want to say it, sorry design team, but it was not the most beautiful video <laughs> anyways. <laughs> so. Like there, there's a thing that, yeah, if you ask a hundred people whether they prefer the generic uh, visuals of this video solution or our facelifted version, I imagine it would be like 50-50 because they're just different, right? I don't have a preference. They're both fine in some way. Like one is not necessarily better, objectively better than the other. Yeah, yeah. Should I should I go to the last feature? All right. We, so, so we already spoke about video. We spoke about payments. We spoke about scheduling. There is one one more. The website builder. Should should we get into it? <laughs> yeah, it's your turn. Oh man. What? Okay. What do we fuck up? One one more. The website builder. Should should we get into it? <laughs> yeah, it's your turn. Oh man. What? Okay. What do we fuck up there? Uh, By the way, a side note, because in a previous episode, previous episode, you called me out for, for swearing because Apple Podcasts flag it, flag it and you have to bleep it. And I just used the F word. I read somewhere, I'm not sure if it's true, but for movies, R-rated movies, I actually get up to three free F words before, before they get flagged as R-rated. So, me, I didn't know. <laughs> So sounds like we can say it one more time. Uh, let's keep it for a good moment. <laughs> is it going to be you or is it going to be me? Who is going to say it? It could be another word as well. Anyways, website builder. So in the first talks about this, we didn't even talk about scheduling. Later on, we realized that Without scheduling, none of the others can work because what is what's common between um, <laughs> payments and meetings? Well, you need to schedule it in some way. You can do it without it. We did it without it, but it doesn't make much sense. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, okay, it's going to be this super simple website where people can basically put a photo of themselves. They can put some information. And later on, they'll be able to schedule meetings as well over there. So a one-pager website. So we built this whole website builder. But you have to realize we still don't have scheduling, right, at this point in time. It is happening in December, and we're still like, okay, we're going to leave scheduling for later. So what is this website exactly? It is a photo, some text, which URLs it didn't work as a URL, and a contact form which didn't work for some time as well, we realized some time ago. But anyways, we built this website builder, absolutely incredible, immaculate website builder. It is the most simple to use website builder I have ever seen. And I've used many, many different website builders. Everybody loves it. Whoever touches it, loves it. Everybody loves the website builder. Without the scheduling though, why do you need this website builder? So that was that was very very premature on our on our end. Uh, again, the main issue with it, however, is that once we created the booking capabilities and the scheduling, we realized that many people actually want just a nice looking booking page, and they don't need the fully fledged website. So that was another pitfall that we fell in, and um, yeah. So if you need the fully fledged website. So that was another pitfall that we fell in. And um, yeah, so if we had done the scheduling before, website builder may have never come to life. It would be just very simplistic booking page with a very simple payment link, which maybe is not even related to any system and with a video 
solution which works. And maybe we would have been ready six months before, right? However, yeah, so that was the problem with the website builder. However, now we have both a booking page and the website builder. Some people are choosing to have just the booking page. Other people are building fully fleshed websites with Trivera. And I have to say, they look amazing, some of them. I, I even have my own website. I, I, I post it everywhere be because I really like it. Yeah, to be fair with this one, I was other website builders that are better. Um, so I always thought of it as a glorified booking page. And in the end, it, it kind of became exactly this. It is this. exactly But this, again, yeah. like this, the scheduling should have been earlier. All right. Anyway, so we've discussed kind of feature wise. We saw that we just ordered them wrong and scheduling should have been much earlier, but we left it for later, which made us go to market a bit um, delayed compared to expectations. But it's okay because we have people now, right? And they use all parts of the system in one way or another, including some even pay using the payment module, even in Malaysian Ringgit. We're processing payments in Malaysian Ringgit. Which is pretty mind-blowing, right? Like, imagine the capability that in several months we build a system which helps Malaysian people pay to each other in Malaysian Ringgit when neither one of us has ever been in Malaysia. I know a guy from Malaysia. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. Ringgit when neither one of us has ever been in Malaysia. I know a guy from Malaysia. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes, that, that, that's your connection. Actually, I just want a bit, a bit of credit to myself. This is one of the things I committed to the, like, this is one of the, the, yes. the updates that I did. At the Malaysian Ringgit, that's, that's because you know a guy from Malaysia, right? That's... I, I, I was the most experienced one and uh, it fell on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But again, this opens the, the, the conversation and I'm just thinking of locality as a concept, right? So we try to do the things that are closest to us. But then this has completely shifted in the online era. So, yeah, country, um, country boundaries just don't don't seem to matter one bit for us, including. So we thought they did because okay, going back again to this pay, okay, going back again to this payment issue, we thought we wanted to target European Union and the United States exclusively initially because those were the countries that at the time were fully supported by Stripe for payments our payment processor is Stripe. And so... We are a verified Stripe partner. We are a verified Stripe partner. <laughs> because we nailed <laughs> payments. Now, why do we nail payments though? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so... Uh, if something... If, if there is one reason why this is worth it, is because when you go to Stripe.com, you can find Triveta as a verified Stripe partner. Which actually does help in ways, right? Because Google thinks highly of us now, etc., etc. So it does have its upside. Yeah, so something I want to add is for content marketing and SEO. Right now, we are at a very exciting route in terms of SEO. We have worked for maybe almost a, a year now. So we started writing the maybe almost a, a year now. So we started writing the first articles on the blog in October of last year. And it took us a very long time to start showing up on Google, to start uh, ranking with these articles. And in June, so it took us six or seven months to actually start properly ranking some articles. And in June, it was the first like breakthrough. And then we, we just like started ranking for more and more and more keywords on Google. And I'm very, very excited about this because when you scale, essentially SEO is what takes you to the next level, right? And we're already working very hard on it. So far, we've created 63 unique articles, which are completely proprietary, that we have put on our blog. And many of them are ranking, they're ranking for different words. And now we're, them are ranking, they're ranking for different words. And now we're testing and doing new stuff in terms of SEO, which maybe I'm going to share in our next status update. Uh, most interesting for you digital marketing people out there. We're using the Ahrefs platform 
to monitor our domain authority, our backlinks, our the keywords that we're ranking for. And actually for one year, we progressed from zero domain authority to 45 out of 100 in terms of domain authority. And this is quite remarkable. Like I have seen many websites, I have built other websites as well. And I know that this is a very, very complex path. It takes a lot of time, a lot of guest blogging. So we are we have our own guest blogs on Zapier, on Thrive Global. Stripe Verified Partners. We are on Thrive Global. Stripe Verified Partners. We are a Stripe Verified Partner, a very important backlink. From the app we have, from Apple, we have from Google. You know, these are very strong indicators for the search engines. And we have all these positive marks. But I remember it was March or April, we still had five domain authority or 0.9. It was absolutely incredible. And then once it started picking up and we started showing up in other places, it rose to 20, 30, 40. Now it's 45. And I'm very excited about this because you have more crawl budget. So Google is crawling your pages more. You rank easier for new words. You make some change to your website and two days later, it's reflected on Google. Otherwise, before I remember quite well, articles which are fundamental for our SEO plan, they weren't crawled for months, for three months to go all the time, and it was not happening. And now we're on a very, very good path in terms of SEO. So, yeah. anyways, so I have several things I want to discuss, and we're very ahead in time. What is your favorite P feature? Ah, that was actually literally my next question for you after discussing the one that you have. Well, I asked it, so we... I asked to grind with it, <laughs> well now, yeah, it was the best one. Or the one we enjoyed building the most. Okay, so let me think. Give me a second. Really? You prepared this question for me and you don't have an answer for it? Well, when I prepare a question, usually while you're answering, I have the time to reflect and figure out an answer for myself when you ask me back. But now you are, you are too quick. <laughs> I think, I don't know, honestly, the part that I'm happiest about when I use it and see it, it just came out neat, is the booking page. I just really like it. It's not the most complex. It's not the most original. It's not the most original. It's not the prettiest either, but it's just so solid, you know, like you go to the booking page and it has such minimal information. It has exactly what you need. It has like one button you can potentially press you can never get confused it's clean it's simple it it always works i, I just really like the booking page <laughs> so that would be my uh, warrior of choice what is yours from day one my favorite feature was going to be customized links and it still is i think this is the one of these killer features one of these things that many companies are not doing well so when you register with Triveta, you don't get to a page which is triveta.com slash John Doe. No, you get John Doe.triveta.com, which sounds not so impressive, but it actually is quite and it has nothing to do with Triveta. It doesn't have the Triveta header in these things. Say you go on Amazon and you put your product over there on go on any marketplace and you put your product over there or yourself over there upwork freelancer.com uh, udemy.com many of these websites e each and every product there is in a subdirectory of the website which means it's amazon.com slash product and then you get the Amazon header Amazon footer all these Amazon brandings all around the place, Amazon UX and so on. With the way we have built it, it could be much different because it is your subdomain. And this is very, very nice for me. That's the first one. Now, all the meetings happen on this subdomain, which was absolutely incredible for me as well. So th th this is the one I like the most. So you send the meeting link to someone, which was absolutely incredible for me as well. So th th this is the one I like the most. So you send the meeting link to someone, it says your name, like my meetings are ilia.triveta.com. Yes, you have the Triveta in, in the name as well, but, but it starts with Ilia. And then 
we also did this extra effort with the structured data, which is very nice. <laughs> so when you send such a link on WhatsApp, on Slack, you share it on Facebook or so on, it is customized or customizable, this whole link, which many other platforms don't have. And it's a very good example that I want to give you is when you share a Facebook link outside of Facebook, everything you see is facebook.com, login or sign up. This is every, every link that is shared from Facebook looks like this, unless you share it on Facebook or on Messenger, I think, or on Messenger, I think. Probably WhatsApp is fine as well. Yeah, so Facebook have not solved this issue and we have solved it. And this is very cool for me. From day one, I wanted this feature and we have this feature. And I think it's one of these things that um, people really appreciate. People who care about these things, they really, really appreciate it. And yeah, that's my favorite feature. All right, so it's kind of on the white labeling side of things. Basically, yeah, if, if, I, have a, if I have a listing on some marketplace like if i make a course in udemy and i send you a link to my course what you're going to see is an enormous udemy logo with enormous udemy letters then my name somewhere at the bottom whereas for us it's the actual professional provider's name rather than ours yeah we try to be good we try to be really good about white labeling i do believe in it a lot as the future and we try to make it as open as possible for people to be able to um, have their own branding because every provider who uses their branding instead of ours, we get less exposure. But I think it's only fair. If these people pay us for our solution, they should be able to use it with their own branding. All right, so what other questions do you have for me? The one year later episode. Yeah, so I just wanted to wrap up the product. You know, we're talking about product so much. There are other aspects of it as well that people may be interested. With product, last thing that we should say, the feedback that we got, do, do you want to comment on a couple of things yeah sure so for background for the listeners basically w when we did this promotion in september and october so just now and we got those hundreds of people signing up and becoming s subscribers to the platform and providers there we received so much feedback from people that for the first time were just flooded with information what to do next what to prioritize uh, which was very nice. We were really happy, not just because finally there's real people telling us what they want from us, but also because we managed to very, very, very quickly turn around and actually implement those things. You know, people asked for, let's say, 10 different features right now. And we managed to get several of them in a matter of days all the way to the live platform. And the people from the promotion... Our partners there were replying to us like, wow, you guys are like so quick. Nobody has ever deployed so quickly. How are you doing it? Actually, to some extent, that's because we, we were so ahead on product. Like we had engineered so much that it made adding those little pieces a bit easier because we kind of had sufficient material to, to, to start from. Like we're halfway there with so many of those things. Yeah, it was, it was just like a crystallization of ideas, let's say. People just told us what they want. Right. And we listened and they're very happy about it. So many of the purchase way there with so many of those things. Yeah, it was it was just like a crystallization of ideas, let's say. People just told us what they want, right? And we listened and they're very happy about it. So many of the purchases that we got were people who asked for a feature, we gave it to them, and only afterwards they replied, Oh wow, you already did this. That was very quick. I'm gonna buy your product because you listened to me and you gave me what I asked you for. So, yeah, that was, that was really, really amazing. Yeah, so you still didn't um, quote any particular features. Several things that we added to our pipeline that we were never considering doing. <laughs> Basically, we said far, far in the future. WordPress plugin, uh, widget that people can um, embed on their websites, and Chrome extension. So all three of these were going to be far, far ahead in the future. However, people actually requested them and because our infrastructure was such a novel to develop those and basically they're going to be out maybe in two, three weeks. Stripe verified partner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, a and a Zapier partner as well. Don't, don't forget. Public partner to be. 
Well, a public answer to our email. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the last thing about product, the team plan. Again, on the strategy side, when we were thinking about this idea, we were kind of imagining professionals, freelancers, or small businesses. And we wanted to do it for individuals, right? And then build, build it up for teams, maybe later on if there is demand. Well, demand hit us in the face <laughs> and people were like, uh, where's the team feature, right? And we quickly realized that building for teams, demand hit us in the face <laughs> and people were like, uh, where's the team feature, right? And we quickly realized that building for teams is much better, of course. So we knew this from, from before, but we wanted to get acquainted with with the individuals first, see how they think, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. So teams of like five, 10 people, there is one guy who is usually buying all the software for the whole team. And this guy knows exactly what they need. And if we provide it, they are gonna buy, let's say five licenses. And the decision-making process is much faster, right? Because they're looking for these things. We realized this a bit later in our development, we were already developing. And then once we started putting, by the way, my kind of mentor or something, when I told him, we're live on Product Hunt, he said, whatever, now point of clients, we really, really felt this demand for the team feature. And we're, we did the UX, UI stage, and we're building the team feature where one, where a whole team can work together. Yeah. Right, so yeah, people want to work together. Uh, and I guess it opened the whole direction of sales and marketing towards instead of B2C and instead of grand enterprise B2B, rather small scale B2B. And that's kind of our next main focus, which got unlocked by this overwhelming feedback that people want the team feature. Okay, so talking about this, I want to make the general point. It's kind of a meta point because it refers to this co conversation as well. Is the fact that we still overkill product in the following sense where we have discussions about you know the company and what to do what we've done what we should do in the future product always takes like nine uh, customer success stories it's very important like we we try to help all of our providers utilize the platform to its full capacity etc so we do many many things but somehow we always end up speaking essentially only about product thinking mainly about product, breathing and eating product, right? We were all about product, which sure, we are a product company, but I do think we overkill a bit, right? And so this episode is just testimony to this. We kind of decided, okay, let's look back in the past one year, what happened? You know, it's it's a startup, right? It doesn't even matter exactly what product we're building. We just want to introspect a bit about the past one year. And we ended up talking about product for one hour. So it's just showing how we, we perceive things very product first and maybe we shouldn't. I generally agree with this, but keep in mind that you do attend all product meetings and you do not attend all marketing meetings. So for you, it's this bias of, ooh, nobody talks about marketing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course. I like, when it comes to product, I'm like probably as involved in product as one could possibly, like I'm fully on the product side, right, uh, for, from the team as Emperor Palpatine would say, I am the product. That was a terrible impression. That was not even in any way <laughs> related to his voice. Anyway. Uh. Um, so that's true, but still, like, it's true, you know, like, we, just this one hour now, we did focus on product. I can recommend you a book about it. It's called Rework. They recommended it to me yesterday, and somebody on the team has to read it. So <laughs> do you want to read it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm w wondering whether to read it myself or like uh, pitch it to someone else. But anyways, it's uh, by the guy who built Ruby on Rails. And what he was saying was that what he's allegedly saying in the book, I have no idea, right? Is that one book, I have no idea, right? Is that once the product was out, they received all this feedback and they basically started reworking the product to get to the version of the product that people actually want. And 
basically that's what we're doing right now. We're exactly in the rework stage where we thought these are the cool stuff, but now we realize they are not the cool stuff and people want some something else, right? And a very, very important point on this one is you receive a lot of feedback and you have to find which feedback to implement and which feedback to not implement. So this is a, this is very, very crucial at the end of the day. Many, many people are talking about this. The customer is always right, but not always, basically. That's what, that's what they say. And the fact that, let's say, two people are very annoyed with something doesn't mean two people are very annoyed with something doesn't mean that the other, like, 98 are not super happy with, with it being this way. Let, let me then just change the phrasing of the common saying that it's not true that the customer is always right, but I would say that many customers are always right. So if many customers are claiming something, they're right. There's, there's no argument there. But if one customer is, there's no argument there. But if one customer is saying something, maybe they're not fully right. Assuming, assuming product market fit, that's the right way to rephrase it but so on our booking page when people were booking they could book and say at 1 p.m half past 1 2 p.m so it was not possible to book at 1 15 1 45 which was intentional let me just interject we intentionally did it to be every half an hour so that you know the booking form doesn't have too many possible options in slots and just doesn't look cluttered right so we intentionally do it every half an hour yeah if you do it every half an hour you have twice as few slots than if you do it every 15 minutes and basically these two people told us a i actually do my meetings at like 15 past whatever hour can you can you please implement this and we implemented it the same day right because since it was intentionally done in this way it was very easy to to go back and we went back <laughs> and then the same person who gave the feedback told us oh my god it's so cluttered with time slots people can't possibly choose and we received this from this guy and then just today we received it from someone else and they're like guys it's so cluttered we received it from someone else and they're like guys it's so cluttered like do something about this so customer is always right but yeah you, you should always keep in mind that sometimes you may skip a piece of feedback yeah right it's, it's gotta be statistically significant to mm. really act on it but even if let's say 50 percent of the people wanted this feature i'm absolutely sure that most of them would be displeased with the outcome right uh, so, also yeah i mean yeah sure also also that side yeah so even if it was very very uh sought after maybe we should have thought about maybe we should think about some other way to solve this issue you know okay enough for product do you want to talk about something else what else is there exactly <laughs> i'm fully in product land like there's nothing else in life for me. yeah okay what is about Branding, content strategy, I don't know, what do, what do you want to know about? Let me ask the following then. We read somewhere in this article, this one, saying that the way you acquire your first 10, your first 100, your first 1,000, and your first 10,000 subscribers are very, very different. So you don't do the same thing. Uh, something has to qualitatively change uh, when you scale up, right? So right now we're at the stage where, where we have several hundred active users that's brilliant and we know how we got here it's through those uh, promotions that we did with external partners now where do we go from here how do we scale from the hundreds to the thousands what's the game plan are you gonna hold me accountable <laughs> no but our listeners will hold you accountable okay okay so generally speaking the first 10 people you acquire so Generally speaking, the first 10 people you acquire in some strange ways, friends, family, friends of friends, whatever, people to just get in the system, even your team, your, your team could be the first people to, to use the product. And they bump into every each and every flow of the product in the beginning. 
then you have to find your first, let's say, 10 paying customers. These could be friends and family, but usually it's it's done with sales. You know, you have to sell it to someone, you have to make deep discounts, you have to build these personal relationships and explain that they're early adopters, that there is much more to the product that is going to come up, that they're going to have some issues. Some people are open to being early adopters, others are not. So this is something which, by the way, we had a, an issue with this because getting early adopters for a platform which uh, processes payment, early adopters. And then you go to the first 100 people. This is done with mainly with sales and you have to uh, reach out to people, again, build relationships, make them use the product, make them pay, close the deals very, very fast. Unfortunately for us, we kind of suck at this. We are not great salespeople. And that's fair. You know, that's that's fine. Uh, you can't be good at everything, especially when we are so technical. So I think I think that people who are more technical, Citeris Paribus, like all OL SQL, are worse salespeople. And the point is that technical people cannot close their eyes to some critical flaw or they cannot oversell the product when they have built it, for instance, or they have thought about it. They ask you a question and you just answer, for instance, or they have thought about it. They ask you a question and you just answer straight. And that's a very big issue. Now, if you have a salesperson who doesn't know the nits and bits of your product, they can confidently sell the product and believe that it is superior or better about because they don't know the flaws that maybe the CTO knows. And I think this is very crucial in, in such a process. We were not convinced before in um, our product because it was beta, it had a bunch of flaws, a bunch of known bugs that, that we were about to fix, and somebody asks you and you can't lie to him, you know. Ignorance is bliss, so salespeople are great at this. They don't know the product so well quite often. Now, fortunately for us, through other means like communities and marketing, we have went past this 100 people mark and we're well past it. This 100 people mark and we're well past it. Of course, again, because we suck at sales and we are great, I hope we're great at marketing, we managed to do this at scale and not like one by one. Now, after you reach this critical mass of people, and it's very important for these people to actually use the system, right? So if I, the fact that we have close to a thousand accounts right now, by the way, we have, we have close to a thousand accounts, out of which several hundred are paying users, out of which some people use the product a lot, right? They're power users of the product. Now, if you give me 100 power users, I can do a lot of stuff with them. If I don't have 100 power users, it's like a, a whole different story. So what is the story? So first of all, everybody's talking about you find the people. You know, I was convinced that coaches are the best product fit for us. We're perfect for them, but for some reason, they just don't trust us. And I can imagine that there are coaching tools that, are, that, the, that all of them are aware of, and they're like, I just don't want to use this product. It's fine. We're perfect for you guys, but ads are not working on them, right? But they work on like consultants and other people. So coaches and consultants, they have very, very close workflows but they're like different different beasts in terms of marketing, targeting, and so on. And once I have these first power users, I can see which people identify themselves with our workflow, like the way we organize their workflow, right? Because essentially that's what we're doing. We're organizing their workflow in some way. So we can see who are these people, how if 10% of the people use the payments, I'm gonna remove this from the ads, right? This is a feature which is not, not so relevant. And these users, they, they give you the information. What, is, what are the sought after features? First, messaging. So that, that is very important. Messaging and kind of targeting. Second, first party data. 
many people talk about this and you have third party data and first party data third party data usually what people were doing with the ads was google and facebook they have all the data of everyone and somebody else is doing something on let's say the website udemy.com they do something and since they're using google analytics google knows what they're doing there and then you target them based on their activity on udemy and Sounds pretty mm, dystopian. Dystopian, but that was dystopian. Dystopian, but that was how it how ads were working, and that that was how everyone was advertising for years. However, things are changing. I have actually have a a theory about this. I think Apple is pushing a lot towards it towards this change because Google and Facebook are um, the main winners from. Uh, third-party cookies, third-party data, because they have the data of everyone and they're they're advertising better, making more money. Apple, they're not advertising. They have the devices. So they're like, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Google, and, Google and Facebook. <laughs> We're just going to make everything super private. And we don't give the emails to the people. We don't give their activity. Everything is private on an Apple device. And people are like, wow, Apple is so cool. And now with the new iOS update, 14 points device. And people are like, wow, Apple is so cool. And now with the new iOS update, 14.5 or something, I can't remember. All apps are asking you, uh, do you want us to track you or do you want us to not track you? And of course, everybody's like, I don't want you to track me. 95% of the people have opted to not be tracked. And if you have an iPhone, chances are your data is not shared with anyone. And if you're in like internet, go use an Apple device, right? At the same time, Google and Facebook are just like very, very pissed at this. And Google, <laughs> Google and uh, Facebook are very, very pissed at this. I guess I can imagine they cannot advertise as well as before. You don't get the same data on your conversions, you don't get the same data on uh, the ads that you're running. For instance, we run an ad, somebody clicks on it, they come to our website, they sign up, and Facebook doesn't know about it because they signed up from, say, an iPhone. And with an iPhone, this data is removed, Facebook doesn't know, ad doesn't know that it's better, and it's not being shown to similar people, which is a very, very big problem. Now, If you have your own data, your first party data, meaning people come to Triveta, they do stuff in Triveta. This is our data. We have the Triveta, they do stuff in Triveta. This is our data. We have the, the, the we have their activity. We have uh, we know what they're doing on our website. We're not sharing it with any third parties. Like this is very important, right? So we're maintaining their privacy, but we know kind of what they're doing. We know how many meetings each provider has. We know how many customers each provider has. And these are normal things, right? They shouldn't be pissed at us or angry in any way that we have this information. This is needed for the system to work. But this is enough information for me as a marketer to say, uh, John has more meetings than Adam, so find me more like John and less like Adam. And this is absolutely crucial, right? This is the game changer in marketing. If you have your first party data, you simply, somebody clicks the ad on Facebook, they sign up on your website, but when you return it to Facebook or this email signed up, Facebook can connect the dots and aha, okay, this ad worked. And later you can also add value um, to each customer. Let's say, as I said, John is much more valuable than Adam. Sorry, Adam. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for being so valuable. <laughs> and, and yeah, so we say, find me more like John. And this is this is absolutely crucial for the marketing. Now, if I don't have 100 power users, at least, like if you, if you give me 10K, that's much easier. But if I don't have even 100, it's very, very hard for me to do any meaningful ads. Now, and apart from this, If I know something about John and Adam, this is very helpful. Like, 
we, I can have a call with John, I can have a call with Adam, and I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a consultant. And then the other thing about John and Adam, this is very helpful. Like, we, I can have a call with John, I can have a call with Adam, and I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a consultant. And then the other guy, I'm a nutritionist. Aha, this is why you use the system more than the other guy, you know? And you can use the system more than the other guy, you know? And you can start making these connections, how people use the product, maybe different segments are using it in a different way. By the way, when in doubt, always segment. And when you don't have data, you can't segment and find these patterns. Back to your question, what happens when you have many customers? First, you speak to them, you know their use cases, you know how they find how they found you, you know why they use you, you know the features they need, you know why they need them, because that, that's what we do. Somebody says, oh, why don't you have feature X? And the first thing I ask is like, why do you need the feature X? Like, how does it fit in your workflow? And then they explain to me, and I'm like, oh, wow, this makes so much sense. Something that I never thought we are going to build is actually absolutely fundamental for this. He chose you because he wants this feature. You build the feature for him, and then you simply market this feature to a thousand other atoms around the world. This is very, very powerful once you have um, users. So, game plan is the following. Find what people want, find what people value the most. We already have a very good idea of this, uh, what they value more than others. For instance, recordings. This is extremely valued. It was never in an ad of ours. We have never promoted recordings. And we have them, you know. From this point on, I'm like, okay, each ad should include this somewhere, either in the image or in the text. People want to be able to record yeah, know the feature ad should include this somewhere, either in the image or in the text. People want to be able to record. Yeah, know the features, start adding them to the messaging. Use the words, by the way, this is the best. Use the same phrases they use. You know, this is a very good marketing strategy. Somebody says, let's say this woman, she asked us, can I have delay? And I'm like, what is, what is delay, you know? And it is basically, if you try to book someone and on Triveta, you can't book them in the next four hours. After four hours and one minute is the first available slot you can book. And the word she used was, I want a 12-hour delay instead of a four-hour delay. I would never call it like this. And I'm not sure if that's a proper term, but I am absolutely certain that there are a thousand people out there who call it delay as well. And this is quite powerful as well for the messaging. Yeah, I get to let them know that you're listening to them. And that's what we're doing now. We are listening really intently to our customers. And actually, because we want to wrap this up now, I'll zoom out a bit and say that that's the most important thing happening to us right now. We have people to listen to. We have people who tell us their thoughts about the product. They're not just speaking empty words they have the so-called skin in the game right they have actually paid to use the service so they're serious they're not just giving their two cents without any attachment to the issue and they're also actually using the platform so they know what they're talking about you know for any listeners again who have or are thinking of having a business a startup do not overlook this for real like it, it takes actually immense amounts of time when suddenly you have hundreds of people and they contact you about various things, some issues, some proposal, proposals, some pesky little bugs or something that happened or just visual bugs or something that happened or just visual issues. It's a very slippery slope. You can very quickly start just quickly replying one-liners to some of those people, but don't really. This is your way upwards, I believe, to really engage with them, not just answer their questions, open the conversation, ask them more questions they're happy to talk to you most of the most of those people are very happy to talk to you and they'll tell you Th those who ask they love to talk yeah essentially right so and then if you ask them you'll find out so much more about their workflow and how they think how they face stuff and as Ilya said you can use this in the marketing so basically being busy with um, customer support let's say and customer success stories is a great thing to have on your hands because uh well that's the key to the next level we believe right 
So to wrap it up, essentially, one year in the making, Threta, where we stand now is that we have the product, it's fairly mature by now. It's we have the product, it's fairly mature by now. It's also very stable, something we didn't talk too much about, but after so many iterations, now it's stable. Now we believe in the product, it just works, right? It doesn't break, it doesn't show random issues, which is very important uh, for a new product to also build trust with our providers. We have several hundred active users and we are looking at how to implement and understand all of their development desires. So then we can use this as our strong points to market further. That's where we are. Yes, thank you so much for coming up with this idea for a podcast. It's for a very long time we wanted to talk about the lessons learned essentially on a very, very high level because this conversation was was on a very, very high level. I would say we didn't get into any specifics that we do on a daily basis. It was just this, what would you do differently? 